I wonder how many of you have actually stood uh, where I'm standing. If you've stood in this spot, raise your hand. In my meager experience, the feel of this spot is not, it's not quite like the other pulpits that I have inhabited. And I've inhabited many because I'm constantly trying to get people to let me do this. Even though I'm frightened about it, it's like a roller coaster. I want to do it and I want to be frightened and I want to survive it. This particular pulpit recalls to me the pulpit described in Moby Dick. I don't want to ask how many of you have read Moby Dick, but how many of you have started Moby Dick? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Early on, a pulpit is described in the Church of the Sailors, and it's, it's made like the bow of a ship. And you're suspended out there to be criticized and hit like a pinata. And it, it, you know, you're, you're out there vulnerable. And it might be the Titanic with no Kate Winslet. <laughs> it's just you on this ship. But it's an incredible privilege uh, to preach the gospel. And uh, it's very scary. It ought to be. It ought to frighten us. Uh, but it's a happy duty in the end. I was born into a Southern Baptist cocoon of a culture. Now, it was a big cocoon. But as that Southern Baptist culture that I inhabited has now, it's really gone. It's broken apart. It's waned away. It, like so many other Christian subcultures in America, is going through a time of malaise, a, a time of rethinking. But I inhabited a Southern Baptist culture that the more distance I get to it, the more I view it as, as a deep and profound and rich and edifying culture that the world is better for having had it than it would have been for not having had it. Martin Marty once said that uh, Southern Baptists for a time had become the Catholics of the South. And I think partly what he was getting at is that it was, it was a dominant kind of culture. And it embodied esprit de corps. It sometimes embodied a kind of pride that is a good pride. And I inhabited that culture. Other groups, even if they were large groups, like the Methodists. The Methodists made a pretty big footprint in northwestern South Carolina. But as Southern Baptists, we, we thought about Methodists if we wanted to. We never had to. But if we wanted to. We were never jealous of them. We, we didn't have to compare ourselves with them. Royals fans in Kansas City are preoccupied with St. Louis. But I'm told that in St. Louis... They, they rarely think about Kansas City at all. And that's the way it was. Even the Methodists. Everybody else was out, out on some periphery. The Presbyterians. The Catholics. The Whiskey Palians. We'll think about them when we have time. We don't have to. I remember the Bible. That Southern Baptist culture was a Bible machine. and It put the Bible in us whether we wanted to or not. You could surrender to it or you could fight it, but they put it in you with memorization, with sword drills. Churches, you know, taking out riders on their insurance policies for the paper cut problem with the sword drills. When we left church, we did whatever we wanted to. And we got involved in all sorts of sinning. 
But if you poked us in the right place while we were sinning, some passage from Habakkuk might just come out involuntarily. (laughs) Because the Bible was in us. And I realize now what I couldn't realize then is that whole apparatus that put the Bible in me, they were planting little salvation bombs, little conversion bombs that God could detonate whenever He wanted to. And He sometimes does. It was a culture that It was a diverse culture. Some of these Yankees we bring in here to teach, you know, which means North and Oxville. And they're trying to figure out Baptists. And the way they figure out Baptists is the last Baptist they talk to, they just project that like Feuerbach into the metaphysical world. And they create a platonic form of Baptist. And then they get with other, other non-Southerners and non-Baptists and impress each other by how much they know. But it was a diverse culture. It had, it had tents with sawdust. And every song was about a mansion. Mansions in the sky. But it had blue-collar Baptists. It had smells and bells Baptists who recite the Lord's Supper and are not afraid of the doxology. I was in a church, we sang the doxology every week. I knew the doxology before I was born. My Southern Baptist is prior to, and I hope not deeper than, my identity as a Christian. But sometimes it feels that way. I think if I became an atheist, I'd still be a Southern Baptist. It's like being a Jew. You can't undo it. I remember the Bible, I remember Jesus Christ put right in front of us week after week. Jesus Christ, He died, He rose for you. Repent and believe and you will belong to Him. And one day, He is going to say something like this to you which he'd already been practiced at saying, come forth. And along the way, maybe he showed you how to move from an inauthentic existence to an authentic existence. But he's doing way more than that. He's raising dead people. It's just fascinating to me that Bultmann decided that we don't find that relevant. I just wonder, how many dead bodies has he leaned over? If God stands him up, won't the relevance kind of crash in on him at that moment? Evangelism and missions. We were sending the missionaries. They were our saints. And we were proud. The first thought in a Baptist mind is not to say, Hey, woman, be a pastor. (laughs) Preach. But Baptists do employ a lot of women in ministry. So if we're employing more women in ministry, some of you who are so proud of your view about women in the ministry, you know, cool your jets. We're paying them cash money. (laughs) And our Baptist women, they do have things to say, and they get it said. Bertha Smith was a missionary to China. She was like a saint. Every now and then she'd come back across that ocean. She was from Calpins, South Carolina, right next to Spartanburg, South Carolina, where I was born, where I was raised. And we would bring her to our church, to our association of churches. And, you know, she was really conservative. 
She believed the Bible. When she caught Baptists that she didn't think believed the Bible or they didn't believe the core doctrines, she didn't like it. But nobody said, hey, Bertha, come preach a sermon. But they would ask her to pray. Well, that involves talking. She'd get to pray, and there was a Southern Baptist high up who didn't believe the Bible the way she thought they, that he should. So he, she prayed for him. She prayed, Lord, change him or take him. <laughs> and you know what God did? He took her. <laughs> We were proud. When I was nine years old, I responded after the sermon to the invitation to the altar call. And I made my way down the aisle and I said, I repent of my sins. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I was baptized. Baptized in a way that's capable of depicting the death and burial of Jesus Christ. No aspersion, no affusion. All the way under. And out. At home, if I describe my home life, I can separate it into two columns. And both columns are true. In one column, I can tell the truth. And it's like something out of Leave it to Beaver or Ozzie and Harriet. It was a beautiful, crisp, optimistic, sunshiny, loving family, and it's all true. My father was a railroad man, and he was a good man. He was a responsible man. And my mother was beautiful, not because she's my mother. She was objectively beautiful. Everyone said so. And they did everything in their power to be good, responsible, loving parents for their two boys. And I remember, so my dad was a coach. He coached me in, in baseball and in uh, basketball, and we, we did sports. I mean, sports were just there. But I remember many times as a child being somewhere where my parents were, and I would look at my parents and just beam inside. I was so proud of my parents. So happy to see others looking at them because they were very much loved and respected. And there's another column. When my brother was born, 13 months before I was born, my mother suffered from postpartum depression. And she tried to take her life for the first time. She cut her wrist. Women, of course, are much... They're often unsuccessful. They don't use guns. Men use guns. And this postpartum depression apparently precipitated the, on, uh, the onset of schizophrenia. Of course, the, these uh, mental illnesses were understood much less then. Diagnosis was even harder then, and the drugs available were not as effective, and so forth. But my paternal grandmother had to take care of me. I don't remember that. I was told that, that, that right after my brother was born, my mother couldn't take of him. A year later, when I was born, it happened again. And again, she cut her wrist. And my paternal grandfather had to take care of me. We were told this, that we, our mother could not take care of us. Schizophrenia is, a, is a, 
a degenerative disease. It gets worse. And so what this meant was is that my mother was totally fine except when she wasn't. And this meant that my home life was like a pendulum swing between when my mother, and we called her Mama, like Elvis. There's no mom or mother. It was Mama and Daddy. When Mama was well, all was well. And she was smart, and she was beautiful, and she was fun-loving. And it was a very, very beautiful thing. And then the bad times would come. Sometimes my uh, father he would pick me up at school and he would say your mom is not well. Sometimes that meant that she was gone. Gone to the hospital. Maybe for a week, maybe for a month, maybe for two months. She would stare into space. Her eyes would be completely dead. She imagined that my father was having affairs. It's paranoid schizophrenia. And as soon as my brother could drive, she prepared us to catch him in an affair. And we tried to catch him. When we would go to a basketball game, my mother would draw me aside and say, you notice that when your father sits on his hands, Miss Fletcher will sit on her hands. It was all, of course, in her mind. And then she would come out of it, and things would just be the way they should be. During that time, one of the things that happened is that I began to feel very alone. No one knows the problems I know. No one's mother has the problems that my mother has. But there was a limit to how alone we could feel because the church stood by us in those days. They stood by us. They put their arms around us. And they held us up. When I was 13, I'd never ridden a horse before, but I had a friend that wanted me to go to his farm and ride horses. So we did. This is the most gentle horse in the world. And so let me tell you something. Nobody knows what an animal's going to do. Motorcycles are not nearly as dangerous. A big beast... You can't predict what that's going to do. I rode that horse in the woods all day. I was feeling great. I had become an equestrian. And then at the end of the day, the horse just took off. Why would a horse do that? They have little tiny brains. I used to have a friend who raised horses, and we would read the Greek New Testament together, and then he'd say, I've got to do something with the horses. He'd go out and rear back and kick the horse just as hard as he could. And I thought, What? He said, oh, he can hardly feel that. But still, why did you do it? He said, well, the horse just did something he's not supposed to do, and if you wait to kick them, then they won't connect the kick with what they just did, that behavior. And if you kick them too late, they'll just think, you know, you and the horse are not friends. (laughs) See, got little tiny brains. They can't retain anything. Then the horse threw me. I tried to catch myself. I broke both of these bones. My daddy in heaven is just laughing out loud about this story. Because when I answer the question, why did I take the marijuana when it was offered? I like to tell a story about how before the horse threw me and I broke both of these bones, I was on my way to a major league pitching career. 
You see, the older I get, the better athlete I used to be. And I don't want to give up that mythology. But that year when I was 13, something new happened. People started hitting the ball when I threw it. All I know is when football season came and the marijuana was offered, I took it. I don't know why. I don't know why. It wasn't actually marijuana. It was oregano. <laughs> I was ripped off the first time I purchased drugs. But then when I bought the real thing, I liked that as well. <laughs> and see, this is when students put on the valuations, don't joke about drugs. And I get that. I'm against them. In my case, marijuana ended up being a gateway drug. And very soon, because I was around people who had other drugs to sell me, I bought those drugs as well. Within two years, I'd become an intravenous drug user. I left sports, I grew my hair out. I was a clean hippie though. I washed my hair with Wella Balsam for the split ends. There was no politics involved in my rebellion. I'm sure that if crack cocaine and or methamphetamines had been available, I would not be alive. Because whatever was available, I took it. I thank God that those two drugs, I never encountered them. They were not available. When I was 16 and a half... I miss having halves. My mother, after 17 years, tried to take her life again. And this time she took pills. And my father and my brother found her on the floor at home. I was not there. I was out doing drugs. And they took her to the hospital and... Because of the medicine, it ripped her colon, and an operation was done, but infection set in. She survived about two and a half weeks. We were able to go to the hospital and talk to her during those two and a half weeks, and uh, then she died. If I have to list the five scenes from my life that I remember the most. One of them is when my father, who was a kind of a typical male, he didn't cry much, he didn't say, I love you much. But when he leaned over my mother's body, he wept. And his body shook. And his tears hit her face. And she did not move. And at that moment, something began to happen inside of me that is akin to what the Apostle Paul says. And what the Apostle Paul said, I think it belongs to what we are at Beeson. I hope it is. I believe it is. He said, if there's no resurrection, we above all people are the most. Don't talk to me about authentic existence. Talk to me about resurrection. That's where our God is involved in. Here's what was happening to me. I, I don't remember not believing the Bible. I had to be deep into theology and philosophy before I could, as deep as a person like me can get, not very, you know, it, I just mean as deep as, it's shallow, but it's where I could go. Before I was able to start doubting things. I had to have people help me to doubt things. I always believed it all. And so it was all there, in the hopper, in the DNA. Isn't there a limit to how much it can mean to me until I'm faced with the need for the kind of salvation that's promised. 
If he can't give her back to me, what does the Bible teach? I think Paul says, if he can't give her back to me, just line up the cocaine. It induces euphoria. Since I left the drugs behind, the only time I ever got any really good drugs was when I had my nose and sinus surgery. And it was after they give you that long sheet with all the uh, side effects. And I had the ropes up in me and I was at home and they'd given me some drug that ended with C-E-T. All of those are good. And my wife comes by and she says, what are you smiling about? Well, I had yelled out in the, you know, it was like three paragraphs of things that could happen to you. You know, everything we take now, one of the side effects is death. (laughs) But embedded in there was the side effect induces euphoria. I yelled that out. When she asked me, what, what, why are you smiling? I just held it up. I went back to the doctor the next week. He said, how you doing? What I should have said is, with the medicine, I'm able to get through. But instead I said, I love that medicine. (laughs) He put me right on Tylenol 3. And the fun was over. My dad became like a ghost around the house. And I just plunged deeper into drugs if that was possible. But what hit the scene at that time was a drug called cannabinol. It was a powder form of the ingredient in marijuana. So very concentrated. At least that's what they told us it was. There weren't any stickers on it to tell us. And then what happened to me is probably what would be called today a drug-induced psychotic episode. But that category didn't exist then. Marijuana can do this. It can induce a psychotic episode. And in that psychotic episode, several things happened. One was this. I thought about God and God only. I started talking about God at school. Word got to my father, something's wrong with your son. And I was committed to a psychiatric ward there in my town of Spartanburg. Let me tell you something. 75% of the people in that psychiatric ward were talking about God. That's what they talk about. People in mental health will tell you. A drug dealer that I knew was in there, he had lost three of the digits off of his fingers that he chopped off. Why did he chop them off? Because Jesus told him to. So religious talk in a psych ward is interpreted through that filter. The psychiatrist told my father, we're going to put him on these drugs, lithium, thorazine, and stelazine. And he will not be able to function in this world without those drugs. Don't you let him get off those drugs. What the doctor thought was likely, because schizophrenia has a genetic component, is that this was the onset of schizophrenia in my life. In fact, my my mother's sister is still alive and she suffers from schizophrenia. In the meantime, I'm involved in this religious thrall and all I want to do is read the Bible go to church I eventually get out of the psych ward and I begin to surreptitiously wean myself off the drugs and I go to church I give up all the drugs except marijuana and this is so ridiculous but it's so true I decided you know obviously this stuff didn't take the way it should I start reading the Bible from the beginning and in the beginning it says he created the green herb that yields seed and he said it was good I agree. I go to church. I walk into this church that I had abandoned three or four years earlier, a church where my parents had been and where half the women there had changed my diapers. And I walked right up to the front pew with my ponytail. I put, it, put my hair back in a ponytail out of respect. And I went up to the front pew and I just leaned forward and just drank it in. That's all I wanted to do. I could not understand why anyone would not want to be at church all the time. I've I've learned why now. (laughs) 
I mean, the horror of Sunday school. I mean, you know, if you're a seminary student, they turn to you for the answers. I don't want any part of it. But at that time, I didn't know any of that. And I was just drinking it in. In the midst of my drug addiction, an event took place that didn't turn me around, but it arrested my attention for a moment. My maternal grandfather, Benjamin Felix Harris, Papa Ben we called him, all of his life he'd simply been an, an, a dark, angry cloud of a person. My mother would tell me how she and her sisters would ask for a few pennies or dimes to go to the dime store or, or, or go see a, the picture show. And he usually wouldn't give them anything, but one time she says he pulled change out of his pocket and he just hurled it at their faces and these coins bounced off their faces. This is the kind of man he was. But in the midst of my drug days... He had a massive heart attack. And a preacher, he'd had, this is his second one, a preacher had gone, witnessed to him, and the first time, my grandfather just gave him the finger. The second time, he said, I believe. And then he lived. And we sang, we, we sang about it earlier. And from that point on, his face was radiant. Now, I'm in the midst of drugs. I'm feeling sorry for Nixon and Brezhnev. I'm thinking if they'll smoke some weed, world peace will break out. So I'm, but I've known my grandfather all of his life, and he is a new creature. I saw that, and it was, it was filed. For two years... Out of that event, I experienced something that I didn't know at that time is not ordinary, or I think it's not. It hasn't been ordinary for me. It's extraordinary. And I miss it. And I want it back. Here's what it was. For two years, the best way I can characterize what was different is this. I loved other people. I was free for God and others. I was satisfied. I was taken care of. I just thought this was the normal Christian life. Maybe it is. Maybe you are doing it and you really feel sorry for me. It stopped after two years. When I preached, people were converted. And I loved people. I didn't see them as threats, encroachments. And it stopped. And I entered into what I guess is the normal Christian life, is the fight for faith. Clinging to His Word. About three years later, this same experience came back. And this time it was strange. I viewed it as something that was like mercury that I had to try to hold on to. It lasted about two days. I begged God. I got on his knee, my knees. I said, don't let me go back to the normal life. I don't, what was it? What does it mean? I don't know what it means, but I'm grateful for it. Was it a glimpse, just a glimpse, a taste of what's coming? We're promised that one day God will examine us and He'll find nothing to displease Him. We'll really glorify Him. Surely one mark of really being an adopted child of God is that we really care about not hurting His reputation. And one of the great troubles of the Christian life is realizing how we do all the time. We hurt His reputation. He ought to receive nothing but good from us. Who he saved. What does it all mean? 
really what I've shared, it's a little slice just of my life. You know, if we could go on, I don't know you would love me to just tell you all of it. It would just be so fascinating to all of us. But it's just a slice. And, and what I've experienced and what I think it means, I'm not really the judge of what it means. God knows what it means. What, ought, what He deserves to get from me and from you is to try to give witness to what He's done. To try to give witness to what He's done. The Bible is chocked full of actual people bearing witness for what the Lord has actually done in their lives. He's not just a God who promises things. He does things. He reaches down into the lives of actual people who deserve nothing but His wrath. And He shows what He can do. He blesses them. He gives them exactly what they don't deserve. And it reflects on Him. The same God who acted there and then, never stopped. The canon might be closed, but God hadn't stopped. He hasn't skipped a beat. Big promises not yet fulfilled, He's, he's accomplishing that. The same God who acted there and then still acts here and now. And He still deserves to have us in our imperfect and halting and sometimes erroneous ways, try to say back to Him, we know You've reached down to us. We know You've touched us. We know you saved us. To God be the glory. I don't know what my life holds or what yours holds. I don't know what's going to happen to you in this life. But I bet you I can predict if you live very long, there's going to be a lot of awful stuff is going to happen. It's going to happen. What will God do? I don't know. But sometimes He causes great reversals that are glorious and wondrous and we couldn't have anticipated. And they go far beyond what we could ever ask or think. And He wants us to ask for these things. And when He does it, we're poised to give Him the glory. And I suspect we're getting little glimpses of what's coming. What's coming? Are we knocked down? Are we beat down? Oh yes, but not like those who have no hope. He draws a line below which it's appropriate for us to go with how we interpret the meaning of what happens. He's made big promises and we're the inheritors of it. Thanks be to God.